Hello, I'm Josh Reeves, and I'm an independent talk radio host, researcher, and documentary filmmaker. My internet radio show, The Global Reality, is listened to in over 30 countries worldwide. In 2004, while reading the book Rule My Secrecy, I came across mention of an ancient and possibly man-made wall buried some seven stories below the town of Rockwall, Texas. Immediately, I became very interested in the subject due to the fact that I've lived in the same area in North Texas where Rockwall is located my entire life, and had often heard stories of strange sightings and bizarre phenomenon in the area. After finding what little information I could about the rock wall, in 2008, I met John Lindsay, an architect and amateur archaeologist who had conducted his own independent excavation on a section of the wall in the late 1990s, but when his funding dried up, the dig was shut down before it was completed. Lindsay gained an interest in the wall from looking at Landsat images from NASA when he worked for them on Apollo 12. He has done extensive analysis and study of the wall and believes it to be a man-made creation. As I began to compile the best available evidence for the wall's unnatural origins, I set out to determine who could have built it and what other places or artifacts similar to what is found at Rockwall exist in North America and even the world. The answers to these questions may shock you as much as they have me, and we will detail these further in the series. The city of Rockwall, Texas is a suburb of Dallas and sits not only on the wall itself, but also on the smallest and one of the wealthiest counties in the state. The National Road of the Republic of Texas, or the Military Road as it was called, was surveyed and constructed in the mid-1840s, and it ran through the area that would later become Rockwall County, running northeast from the Red River to near the site of present-day Dallas. The cities of Rockwall and Heath were founded along this road. The state of Texas was admitted into the United States of America on December 29, 1845. In 1846, the area of Rockwall County was included in Henderson County, and when Kaufman County was formed in February 1848, the region became part of that county. Sterling Rex Barnes was the first person to settle in Rockwall County in 1846, according to Mercer Colony documents. His land was situated between the East Fork and the Military Road. He constructed a ferry on the East Fork of the Trinity River in 1848 and obtained a permit from the state of Texas to build a bridge across the river. Barnes was followed by other Mercer colonists, including Ephraim and John Oswell Heath in 1846, who built their cabin near the site of Barnes Bridge and called their community Black Hill, named for the infamous black, waxy soil of the area. In 1848, Benjamin F. Boydston, Terry U. Wade, and Jared Stevens arrived, and all brought their families to the region to establish a farming community. Stevens, Boydston, and Wade were hoping to establish a trading post on the eastern shore of the East Fork of the Trinity River. Although friends, the three men were at odds among themselves, each declaring to be the first settler at the site and deserving to have the future town named for themselves. In 1849, James Truitt settled two miles north of Rockwall and established a community called Locust Grove. And after living in a makeshift cabin for a few years, in 1851, Terry Utley Wade and his family began building a permanent house on the east side of the East Fork of the Trinity River Valley near the western edge of the present site of the Rockwall Square. In the process of digging the homestead water well, Mr. Wade hit a stone formation. Further digging and investigation discovered a rock wall below the surface. The wall ran an extended length across Wade's property and that of his neighbors. Barnes and Heath, the first two settlers, were both Freemasons, and recognized the building style as the work of stonemasons, and their immediate reaction upon seeing the wall was that it was a remnant of a lost civilization. Thus, this was where the idea first had its genesis. They decided that that fact meant that none of them were actually the first settler of the area, and instead of naming their new settlement after themselves, they named it for the rock wall, resolving their differences. On April 17, 1854, Elijah Elgin donated 40 acres of his land to establish a town at the site, centrally located in the panhandle of Kaufman County. This community became known as Rockwall. The following is information gathered from Mary Patty Gibson, granddaughter of T.U. Wade. She described the additional digging her grandfather and other men did at the home site. In this description were cubicles or rooms constructed of stone which you could walk through and would reach a quarter which seemed to run in a direction into the hill that the town square sits above. She told of an incident in 1906 of two unidentified men digging out the corridor which had apparently been filled with erosion. Their intent was to reach a room or cavity under the town which would be full of gold, apparently derived in part from Indian legend. The ceiling of the corridor had steep slopes, described as a Gothic-type arched ceiling, much like what the Mayans built, and the further into the corridor the two men excavated, the steeper the slope of the ceiling became. Consequently, the men, fearful of a structural failure, abandoned their search for gold. 
The Rockwall Courthouse was erected on this site in 1941. She also spoke of her grandfather's exploration of the wall and that he discovered on the outside that the wall went straight down. But on the inside, she described the wall as going down to about 40 feet, curving inward and becoming much thicker. This sounded like a buttress effect that has been used to support high standing structures and implies direction and transfer of live loads. Additional information provided by the daughter of the late Mr. DeWeese, an early settler of Rockwall, described a doorway with a diagonal shaped stone in the wall at the Wade residence on Highway 66. This portion of the wall was open to visitors from 1936 until the late 1940s and was consequently backfilled supposedly because of dangerous structural conditions. On Friday, May 28, 1886, the following article appeared in the Rockwall Success, Rockwall County's first newspaper. The greatest wonders that we have to record this week is the finding of a petrified human skull. While at work last Saturday, Ben Burton unearthed with his plow a gigantic skull fully as large as a half bushel. The staring sockets wherein the eyeballs once rolled were as large as a half gallon cup. Some few of the jaw teeth still remained. This goes to prove that this county was once inhabited by a race of people that would be wonderful to look at now. Dr. Wiggins thinks it is the skull of some antediluvian giant that would have weighed at least a thousand pounds. Anyone wishing to see this mammoth skull can do so by calling at the success office. As Mr. Burton says, he will leave it there for inspection. Signed, Sam Slick. The dateline was Buffalo. A small community south of Rockwall, believed to now be a part of Heath, a week later on June 4th, a follow-up appeared again, Dateline Buffalo, entitled The Mystery Solved. The Rockwall is Human Handiwork. Wonders will never cease. Immediately after it was generally known that Mr. J.B. Burton had found the gigantic petrified skull, a large crowd collected and set about making an examination of the surrounding ground. Spades, picks, and axes were plentiful and in use. Mr. W.R. Greer might have been seen pounding the ground with a huge hammer and intently listening after each successive blow when he was heard to call out, This way, boys. There was a general rush to his position. Listen, boys, said Greer as he brought the hammer down with a heavy thump on a large flat rock. To the astonishment of all, the hammer slipped from Greer's hands and after a short interval was heard to strike something below that had the clear, distinct ring of metal. Now the wildest excitement prevailed. A lantern and rope were quickly brought, and the earth was rapidly cleared away. The hole in the rock, which proved to be slate, was enlarged, and the lantern was let down into the murky darkness. At last, Mr. Burton, Greer, and J.B. Steger volunteered to descend and explore the mystery. The cavity proved to be a chamber about 60 by 100 feet square and 40 feet from the floor to the slate roof through which they had effected an entrance. This roof was supported on pillars of black marble whose polished sides glittered in the lamplight and made one think of the Orient. This underground palace will undoubtedly astonish the world when thoroughly explored. In one corner stands a large iron chest supposed to be full of gold or valuables, which was so heavy as to baffle all efforts to remove it. Among other things found was a huge iron bedstead, 25 feet long and a pair of sandals 3 feet wide by 10 inches wide. A battle axe with a pole handle 12 feet long, which weighed at least 75 pounds. The explorers extended their investigation no further, but are sure that there are other rooms connected with the one visited. The noted rock wall from which our county takes its name runs in a few yards of this palace. This, we think, settles that mystery. All surrounding circumstances go to show that this Goliath built the rock wall to enclose his vast estate. Another visit has been made, the result of which your correspondent has not yet ascertained. Signed, Sam Slick. The final report came on June 11, 1886, one week later. We told you in our last that another search had been made. Your correspondent visited this wonderful subterranean palace to ascertain for himself the most incredible facts connected with it. We arrived in time and were invited to descend with the exploring party consisting of J.B. Steger, J.B. Greer, Jess Hanley, Tom Bratcher, J.B. Burton and Dr. Wiggins, and your correspondent. We at once began examining the walls and found on the north side a huge iron door which yielded to our efforts, assisted by a crowbar and a sledgehammer. As it swung round on its rusty hinges, this harsh grating sound was echoed and re-echoed from the cavern of darkness that lay before us. No one was in a hurry to go in, as a heavy noise was heard like the slamming of a door, and each feared to intrude. Finally, Steger thrust his lantern forth and peered in at last and walked forward, followed by the party. Mr. Editor, I have read of unearthing buried cities and of the mysterious things found in them, but never did I dream of seeing what we did that day. 
Tom Bratcher's eyes could have been snared off with a grapevine. Dr. Wiggins, Greer, and Steger and Hanley gazed in awe at what met their sight. A huge iron kettle swung near the floor. It would hold at least a thousand gallons. And against it leaned a fork as large as a hay fork. You can better imagine our consternation when I tell you what we saw in that kettle. A mass of bones and grinning, staring skulls. Dr. Wiggins touched one with his cane and it fell into dust. There is no doubt that the ancient Goliath whose residence this was, was a fierce cannibal. But may I be delivered from what we next encountered. In the center of the hall, we found an iron trap door, which our combined strength at last raised. When from out of the stinging darkness, there flapped screaming a huge bird with eyes like Poe's nevermore raven. In a dismal, half-human voice, in grating screeches, the great bird seemed to cry, Get out of here! Get out of here! It was needless to say that in mad terror, we hastily obeyed. As the bird, blinded by the light, flew from wall to wall, we quickly reached the platform whence we were hastily drawn to the open air. Steger, Greer, and Bratcher fainted, and Dr. Wiggins was so unnerved that he could do nothing for them. They were resuscitated by throwing cold water into their faces. Bratcher said he would not have fainted if it had not been, for when they opened the trap door, he smelled something like yarn socks. Signed, Sam Slick. These reports have been largely dismissed by most Rockwall researchers as satire due to the author using the pen name Sam Slick. Sam Slick was a pseudonym for a Canadian satirical writer popular in both Canada and the United States in the 1800s. After researching this Sam Slick character, a couple of things came to my attention that completely destroy the Sam Slick theory. Sam Slick, whose real name was Thomas Chandler Halliburton, a politician, judge, and author in the British colony of Nova Scotia, did not publish his writings in newspapers but in books that were distributed in the U.S. and Canada. Not to mention these articles were published one week apart from each other, making it impossible for anyone in Canada to send writings in a week to Texas in 1886. But even these points are made irrelevant by the fact that Sam Slick, a.k.a. Thomas Chandler Halliburton, died in 1865, making it impossible for him to have written satirical tall tales of giant skeletons being found near Rockwall in 1886. I also searched for other examples of satire in old newspapers from that era that printed similar wild and outlandish tales as has been suggested these reports were and could not find one. Newspapers were a powerful force in those days and people could be lynched for spreading fictional stories posing as the truth. This fact was obviously on the mind of the gentleman who used the Sam Slick pen name in the Rockwell newspaper stories as the information he wrote about sounds unbelievable and he probably feared for his own safety. Whatever the case may be, it's made all the more interesting by the fact that one week after the last Sam Slick story ran, the Rockwall Success newspaper was bought out and no further stories of the kind ever appeared. After that, the skull is said to have been taken into custody by the Smithsonian Institution, where it is presumably held to this day. Time and again in my research, the Smithsonian Institution's name came up as the keeper of crucial evidence key to any proper investigation into these lost secrets. We will discuss the Smithsonian Institution, Giants, and Mounds coming up later. Now let's continue to look at the important rock wall facts chronologically. In 1901, Dr. Robert T. Hill, a Texas geologist, published an article about the rock wall and classified them as clastic sand dikes and a part of the Balcones fault system. In 1909, Sidney Page published an article in Science Magazine entitled the Rock Wall of Rock Wall, Texas. He stated, quote, The writer was able during the past winter to spend a few days investigating this supposed historic structure. It proves to be not a wall, but a number of disconnected sandstone dikes, strictly speaking, not surrounding the town, but trending in many directions. In 1925, world-famous archaeologist Count Byron de Prorock was brought to Rock Wall to examine the structure. The Pro Rock stated that he had only seen stones like these one other place in the world, in Carthage in North Africa, an ancient Phoenician Canaanite city. The Pro Rock was loved by audiences and held in contempt by the scientific community for his daring adventure stories and his challenging of accepted scientific dogma. In 1927, hot on the heels of DeProrock's comments on the rock wall, the Smithsonian Institute sent two scientists to examine the wall by the names of L.W. Stevenson and J.W. Fuchs. Stevenson and Fuchs deemed it to be a natural formation, and their verdict made in 1927, mind you, stands to this day in the realms of scientific opinion. 
1933, a map was prepared by Martin Kelsey and Harold Denton with the aid of J.S. Mason, Rockwall County surveyor, of all the discovered outcroppings thought to be the wall at that time. There were 11 known outcroppings, and these so-called outcroppings were believed at the time to be above ground visible parts of the wall and were the sites that the aforementioned scientists based their opinion of the wall being natural on. And right here is where we start to see holes in those opinions. When we enter the latitude and longitude of these so-called outcroppings into Google Earth and overlay John Lindsay's map, we can clearly see that these outcroppings do not occur on the actual wall itself, but fall inside the perimeter of the wall structure. This leads us to the conclusion that we are dealing with two different types of phenomenon here, either by accident or by design. The two are being jumbled together, creating confusion as to what is really the wall and what isn't. Since, according to official records, we know that there were not any major excavations done at the rock wall until 1936, when it was put on display to the public at the site of the old Wade farm, and we've established that the wall is buried deep underground, then the opinion that these scientists from the Smithsonian and other institutions established is obviously being based on flawed data. This is why I believe there is so much confusion on the part of interested parties who believe they can just come to rock wall and see the wall. We have a set in stone scientific opinion on the wall that was established in 1927, an opinion that was not given from an observance of an archaeological excavation, but from these so-called outcroppings outlined in the 1933 survey. And these may or may not be the actual wall itself. And this opinion has gone unchallenged by the mainstream of science and academia ever since, despite the huge advancements in technology that could prove otherwise. This is one of the major goals of this film series. I hope to force a new examination of the rock wall phenomenon based on the research data and new understandings we now have attained since 1927. In 1936, coinciding with the Texas State Centennial, a section of the wall is excavated and open for viewers for a small admittance fee. The attraction is owned by RF Canop. In the first few months, the attraction averaged 70 visitors per day. In the late 1940s, a state geologist pressured the Texas Historical Commission to close Mr. Knipp's 10 cents a look exhibit on Highway 66 because Mr. Knipp advertised the section of the wall as a part of a prehistoric buried city. The geologist maintained that this was a fraud being foisted on the public. Mr. Knipp later cited structural instability as the reason for closing and backfilling the site, but we know this was not the actual reason. In 1949, a Mr. Sanders of Fort Worth conducts an excavation on property near what is now FM 549 and Cornelius Road. The rocks in this excavation average 12 to 14 inches thick. Interestingly, no one has ever been able to track down any trace of Mr. Sanders, but we do have these photos of his excavation. In 1950, Dr. James L. Glenn, a local doctor who was fascinated with the wall and discovered this artifact in a ravine near the wall, believed it to be a representation of the Mayan god Quetzalcoatl. Published in an essay, photographic essay on the system of rock walls at Rockwall, Texas, among his observations, Glenn states, quote, The fact that there is a natural fault here does not preclude the construction of other walls by a prehistoric race within the same region. Here, he is implying two different types of phenomena. In 1959, Dr. John T. Lonsdale denounces Dr. Hill from the University of Texas's claim from 1901 by asserting that the Balcones fault has not been traced with any significance beyond the Hill County, and that no known fault system runs through Rockwall County. In 1976, the Rockwall is excavated under the direction of the county on land located near present-day FM 549 in Cornelius Road, the same site where Mr. Sanders had excavated in 1949. The excavation is open to the public, and hundreds of schoolchildren visit the wall. Also, in 1976, to commemorate the Texas sesquicentennial, this makeshift model of the wall was constructed in front of the Rockwall Courthouse, where it sits to this day. It is comprised of stones taken from the 76 dig. In 1979, Dr. Kenneth Shar of the University of Texas at Arlington and his students exposed two walls for study. Shar concluded that both of the sections he examined were natural formations, but does not rule out the possibility that another portion could be man-made. No further excavations were presumably done until John Lindsay's dig in the late 1990s. It becomes abundantly clear when one examines the physical evidence that what we are dealing with in Rockwall is two distinctly different types of phenomenon that are being lumped together as the same thing in order to keep any real headway from being made in terms of an honest investigation. We will get into more details about the wall itself later, but uh, now I'd like to move on to where I began in my research for this film. Once I had established that we are no doubt dealing with two different types of phenomenon at the rock wall, one natural and one made by someone, 
I began to search for who could have built it and search for other evidence of this stuff in the United States. Ancient builders, prehistoric races, ancient civilizations, etc. I started by investigating more into the reports of giant remains being found and discovered many more reports of these giant skeletons being found in the United States, particularly near mounds or other structures. I started to see a striking correlation between the reports from the rock wall area and the reports from other states all around the country. Many that ended with the remains being taken away, never to be seen or heard from again, in many cases by the Smithsonian. Since I had heard stories about mounds in Rockwall County and have always been puzzled by the strange and dramatic elevation changes in Rockwall, which are very uncommon in this area, as well as finding out that the location called Buffalo from the news reports of giants was also called Black Hill before that because of the huge black mounds of dirt found there, which now presumably lie under the town of Heath. I was astonished to find so many examples, and I began a deep research effort in hope of finding who these sophisticated and advanced builders may have been. Discoveries of giant skeletons in America go back to colonial times. These discoveries were, in almost every case, found near mounds and other earthworks. Sometimes they were made of rock and stone. To my amazement, I found story after story in old newspapers and books of remains of giants being found with stories that were very similar to what was allegedly found near Rockwall. Are we to believe that all of these are just simply flights of fancy? Tall tales, as some who have researched the Rockwall phenomenon have suggested? Few Americans today are aware that once real giants roamed the land, red-headed humans, giants. Most Americans believe that the Native Americans were the first to inhabit the North American continent. Yet there were others, a much more ancient race that walked the hills and valleys, the plains and deserts of the pre-Columbian Americas. Evidence of giant humans, people 7 to 12 feet tall, exist in the fossil records, tools, and artifacts recovered from archaeological digs. Giant skeletal remains have awed and sometimes frightened researchers and explorers as far back as the 16th century. Some present-day Native American tribes still recite legends of the giants and how their ancestors fought wars against them when they arrived in North America only to find the giants already here. Others, like the Aztecs and Mayas, record their encounters with a race of giants to the north when they ventured out on expeditions. Here are some, but certainly not all, of the examples of reports of giant remains found in America. 